All right, there we go. Um, it is said that uh, chess is a Drosophila of reasoning, a uh, model organism of sorts. Basically, in genetics, if you wanna, if you have a conjecture and you wanna try something out, you never go to humans first, of course. You go to the fruit fly or the Drosophila. Uh, and so, it was the fathers of computer science that, uh, when they were thinking about intelligent machines of the future, they thought of chess as the main milestone on that journey. It was thought that you know once. Uh, a computer program was able to, you know, match a human strength in chess. Uh, that would be artificial intelligence. Uh, when a computer program would be able to defeat the human world champion, you know, then we would enter in some sort of a state of robot apocalypse where, you know, we get enslaved by robots and stuff. We know that that wasn't. True, uh, that did happen. Uh, in 1997, a computer program called Deep Blue managed to beat Garry Kasparov in a, in a match. Um, and you know, we had to ask ourselves two questions uh, after, this, after this happened. Uh, one was, you know, was, was chess sold? Like, what well, was that it? Do we just pack our chess sets and leave? Uh, and the other one was, was this AI? Um, was this what we witnessed, uh, like an embodiment of artificial intelligence, and then, you know, um, the robot apocalypse uh, would would begin the next year? We knew that chess wasn't sold. Um, human players kept getting better. Uh, that's that's for sure. Uh, computers kept getting better. So I was a very young player in the early 2000s when engines like Ripka and Fritz. Uh, and Houdini were, were there, were generally accessible, were sort of open source to the, to the, to the entire community. Um, and they were, to, you know, they, were, they were a generation better than, than Deep Blue, who was previously better than, than Kasparov. In 2006, I was 11 years old, Montenegro was still zero. Uh, when, um, when, when this interesting match uh, was played, uh, where Vladimir Kramnik, the then reigning world champion, uh, managed to lose quite convincingly uh, to Deep Fritz, who was the, which was the state of the art in, in terms of computer engines at the time. Um, the computer program managed to win two and, and draw four games, uh, thus you know, leaving uh, an impression that it was no longer a challenge for the machine to play against humans. I'm bringing this up also to bring, uh, to bring up this position from the second game of the match, um, in which Kramnik here as black had a, had a very nice end game position in which he was slightly better. Um, and then ev everything sort of went downhill from there. Um, he played this innocuous looking move, queen e3. Uh, he moved his queen over to uh, initiate a trade and you know, continue playing this, this slightly better end game. But then he missed something that was incredibly obvious, uh, something that he really sees in his sleep. And I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating here. Um, he can be doing something else, and then you could dictate this position, and then he'll, he'll figure it out. Not only him. I could do it as well. I'm a relative amateur. You know, the most, most, most people, most of you who are in the audience now could see that this, that could see this mate threat in one. But he didn't. Um, and you know, luckily, he didn't feel too sad about it, because he knew that it wasn't the first, and it's, it was definitely not going to be the last time uh, a player of his caliber makes this kind of a mistake. In fact, in chess, we have a term for this, and we call these blunders, wherein a human player is, becomes sort of temporarily blind to something that would otherwise be so obvious. You know, people. Uh, they get emotional, they get, uh, you know, psychologically instable. It is in our nature to behave that way. We also get tired, we get agitated, we get, um, you know, stressed out by, by, by big matches. Gary Kasparov famously got psyched out in his match against Deep Blue, thinking there were people behind the screen uh, and so on. But machines, unlike humans, machines don't make those kinds of mistakes. Uh, even the most rudimentary of engines from the 1970s or 80s would never miss a made-in-one. 
In fact, today's engines like Stockfish or Houdini, the, the newer generations, they would never miss a mate in 20 or 25 if such a position arises. So we need to go back um, to the question that we asked at the very beginning and ask ourselves, is this what artificial intelligence is all about? And to some it might seem that yeah, yeah, kinda, yeah, it does look like that. But I would say no, because the way we program these computer programs, it becomes about encoding our understanding of chess into them. So stuff like, you know, whose king is better, or who has more pieces, or you know, who's, um, who has the control of the center, or who has the control of the open files. Dozens, hundreds of these questions are asked by chess masters and human programmers. They, they sort of work in sync on this. And then the machine just crunches numbers and answers these questions, computing an evaluation of a, of a position. So here we're really talking about human intelligence, the ability to encode our understanding of such a complex and creative game into something that a machine could understand. We need to hold our machines to no lesser standards of intelligence than we do to humans. And in humans, intelligence becomes about um, inventing. It becomes about understanding, developing new ideas. Engines like Stockfish and Houdini, they cannot suggest anything new because they only apply something that we taught them how to do. They just crunch numbers like we never can. They, they are better by design almost because they know most of what we know and they're, they're better at, you know, they have the more computing power to see farther into the future. So how could you as a human beat something that, that has that advantage, that doesn't get tired, that's always on its best day, that always plays with, uh, with, with this ferocity that's, that's associated with, with great chess players. So, not really AI, right? Um, people over at DeepMind thought the same. Uh, it's a London-based company, uh, and they said, let's, let's do this. Let's teach a machine what the rules of chess are, like day one of, of every human's encounter with chess. Uh, what, this, is, this is how the pieces move, this is how the pieces move, this is you know, what checkmate is, this is what a draw is. And then let it figure stuff out on its own. Right? And that kind of approach leads to interesting consequences. AlphaZero, the program that they created, was able to do that through self-play. So no sort of questions, no heuristics that were asked by humans. So no human intelligence was involved except for teaching them how to learn in general. No domain-specific knowledge, no a machine that could today play chess could tomorrow play another game, stuff like that. So what happened was interesting because the machine was able to reinvent a lot of things that we as humans in invented over a long time period, you know, through these genius plays by, by, by competitive people who were really good at chess. Now, the intelligent part becomes about invention, right? We said that. And the machine did invent some things. And it was striking because we, we put so much effort into, into exploring chess, into equipping our computers with this knowledge and then letting them run on their large compute power. AlphaZero in that became a, ba a, a, a big game changer in the field. It was able to say, look, the king safety or the peace activity or you know, those heuristics, they don't really matter as much or they do matter more than, than you thought they would. These long-term attacks, they work. And I can prove that by beating the best, best traditional engine out there. I can beat Stockfish quite convincingly if you, if you allow. We have a lot to learn as chess players. Magnus Carlsen, who, has, who is notorious for his great understanding of chess, said over in May that, you know, it is clear that we've just scratched the surface of chess. And when someone who is that good, someone who is considered to be, you know, one of the few best players to ever play the game, when he says that, then you know it's the real deal. I want to say this. 
at some, at some point, it, you know, intelligence is sort of there. You know, today it is games of chess, Go, Shogi, Japanese chess. Tomorrow it could be, you know, medical diagnostics. It could be climate change. It could be the problems in renewable energy. It is this kind of a parallel universe in which some species that's, that's awfully similar to humans takes chess and then develops it to its limits. It develops new ideas. Imagine this world in which we are able to, you know, after decades of teaching machines how to do various things, imagine the world in which you are able to learn from machines as if there was, a, there was an alternate civilization in which you could, you could do the same. At the end, I wanna, I wanna leave you with this, with this image in your mind. Think about this, think about what this, what this means for the world. I would say that the Drosophila experiment worked. And that's the big news that I came here to, to, to share with you. I can't help but wonder what is next in line, what do we do from here? Thanks. <laughs>